Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Scott from Warmly Yours and my name is Anatoly. And we'd like to thank you for joining our webinar today and that is on how to repair in-floor heating. Um, a lot of us have been in this business for quite a while and this is uh, one of the things when I started that it was quite a mystery and no one really wanted to know it, wanted us to know how to do this but um, we figured hey sometimes things happen out in the field and it's always a good idea to be able to fix whatever comes up. So that's why we're addressing this today because every once in a while we know that every, you know we're human and sure. we all make mistakes and something happens and we need to make sure that we can fix our problems. So that's why we're here. We thank you so much for joining us today. So let's go on to our next slide. And I'm sorry, this is my first time for running the mouse. So we appreciate <laughs> you sticking with us here. If you have any questions during this webinar, feel free to join us and type in whatever you're feeling, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're wondering, and we'll be glad to address your questions. So um, that's why it's here. It's in that little white box that's on the left side. Now, let's take a look at floor heating damage. And Anatoly, what are some signs that the floor might have been damaged when it was installed? Yeah, so first of all, the biggest sign that typically you would see on your thermostat or on your controller device would be the GFI message that can pop up or the breaker may trip or just simply the floor will not be heated. Uh, those, both of these conditions can easily be tested with a digital ohmmeter to understand what exactly is happening with the system, either it's having a short or there is a break. Uh, a common example of how wires are damaged that can be just nicked with a sharp trowel while installing or cleaning grout lines with a sharp blade. Uh, what we always recommend is to use a circuit check and ohmmeter throughout the installation that will help to understand if the system is not damaged at every stage of the installation. And this last point is a big one. Sure, sure. Again, the circuit check is a great device. First of all, it's a monitoring device that helps you to uh, continue doing the installation, while the circuit check is just monitoring that and will alarm whenever there is a problem in the line. Uh, all meter, another great tool where it gives you the exact value, exact resistance of what your system is to still ensure it's still within the range. And the last thing is uh, also there is a, a such thing as a cold and hot spot. These are the signs of an incorrect install that you can see here on the picture, on thermal picture on the right side. Uh, those can cause further wire overheating and damage when the wires are spaced too close together. So that's great. This picture is a great picture because this is a case where there is no damage. It was just installed incorrectly. If you look on this picture, a lot of our troubleshooting is done with thermal cameras and thermal cameras are becoming pretty prevalent out in the world today. You can actually rent them at a large uh, big box stores that you have them for rental now. And this example here is there's nothing wrong with the system. The system is heating as it should. The problem is the wire is just in the middle of the floor and you've got a cold section over on the left and a cold section over on the right. That's installation problem. And we talked about the wires getting too close when the wires get too close, they overheat. And if they ever overlap each other, that's when you're going to have real trouble. So that's what's so great about this picture because this actually shows you a picture of a system that was installed incorrectly. It's got a big, big space there that's cold represented by the blue part of the picture. So this is what's so great about thermal imaging. So let's take a look at what's actually in the troubleshooting kit when you get it from us. And that uh, those parts are a high pot tester there on the left, uh, the Variac transformer, which means variable AC transformer, which means you can go from zero volts up to 120. Also, we have the cable fault finder, which is sometimes called the short stop. We have a digital multimeter, which you can get at any big box store. 90% uh, of your troubleshooting on the floors that you'll be dealing with can be done with this simple device, and they're available for under $20 at most stores also. And we also have the thermal camera, which you can get at big box stores. But if you can't find one locally, you can always rent them from us. So that's our troubleshooting kit. Now let's talk about the ohms meter and what it's used for. Right, yeah. So the ohm meter would be, like we spoke before, would be really the first step towards any successful troubleshooting because the ohm meter will help us to understand what's happening with that floor. Uh, we start with testing it. Uh, the main important task that we will to do is understand if there is any short on the floor. And to do that test, we simply measure the resistance between the core 
each of the core wires and its own ground. Uh, you want to ensure there is no resistance there or no continuity there because that would indicate that there is no short circuit present. And the last test, test number three outlined here on the slide, would be to test across the red and black wires, which are your two core wires, your main heating conductor, heating circuit here. And if you have the resistance that is uh, according to the label on the mat, then you are good. However, if there is an open uh, reading there, that would indicate there is a damage or it has an open circuit. Now, what's so great about our particular product is it has color-coded wires inside of the cold leaf. And that means if you have a red and black center core wire, that means 240 volts. If you have yellow and black, that means 120 volts. So if you're ever out troubleshooting a floor and you go, all right, I've got six mats in this floor, five of them have red and black wires in the cold lead, and one of them has yellow and black in the cold lead, that's a bad combination. Right, right off the bat, you can tell that the wrong voltage was installed into that, into that problem, into that area, and that could be your problem. Uh, if you take a look in a nutshell at these, at these um, drawings here on the right side, one and two are testing for shorts. That's a very simple thing. One and two are shorts. You shouldn't have any ohm readings there. The last one, number three, is testing to see if you have a continuous circuit. Notice how we're not showing a, a circuit check to do this. Right. We're also not showing a, um, a continuity checker. Continuity checkers are no good for this um, particular process. And also, the ohm meter that we're showing you is a digital ohm meter, not an analog meter with a needle that goes back and forth. If you are thinking about doing some troubleshooting with a um, analog meter, I'm going to save you some steps right now and say it's probably a pretty good idea to go out and get one of these inexpensive digital multimeters because we have problems with people that use analog ones. That's just a little bit of wisdom here that we are passing on. will hopefully save you some time and effort. So let's take a look at this next item. And this next item is called a shortstop. Back in the day, this is what we used. Um, Tell us about the shortstop, what it tells us, and what its shortcomings are. Right. So the shortstop is uh, the name for the device. Uh, another very commonly used name would be just a simply, uh, simply cable fault finder. That device just tells you the distance from the point you're measuring to the point where the break is in the cable. And what we mean by break, it can be a short, it can be just an open circuit. So uh, when you're starting to work with that device, you first want to set up the BOP setting on the meter. Uh, on the shortstop that is uh, pertaining to each size of the mat that we have. And again, we have all those values included in the instructions, so you will have uh, the full list of the mats we have with all of these values, which should not be a problem. And then uh, the actual process, the operation uh, of the device is pretty simple. You twist your two conductors, which in this case on the picture is a black and yellow conductor together, connected to one probe. Again, it's here on the image is connected to the red alligator clip and you connect the ground to your black alligator clip. Turn on the shortstop, and the reading will appear in feet. And again, it's just going to be the full length of the wire from that point you're measuring to the point where the break is. So the problem with this device is it is used primarily when you have an installation plan from us, a smart plan. And you can see how the system is set up inside your room, where the cuts and turns are and where it goes. If your installer decided not to follow that, like uh, the guy I had this morning, um, what we had is we had a reading of 38 feet and we didn't know, um, he had no plan to go off of, but I did know that it takes about five feet, six feet of wire inside the wall and coming out of the box. So I subtract 36, 38 and subtract six. So I'm right about 32 feet. So I know that within 32 feet of where the, um, the baseboard, where the wire comes out of the baseboard, is where the problem is. It's got to be within that amount of feet. So I know that I'm not going to be looking on the other side of the room for this spot that I'm going to be generating a little bit later. So if you don't have a plan, you can still use the shortstop to find out exactly, uh, find out kind of where the problem is in the floor. If it says 10 or 11 feet, it tells you it's pretty close to where the thermostat is. If it tells you 792 feet, it tells you it's probably going to be out on the other side of that room somewhere. So that's going to be a, a pretty good tool to at least tell you where to look if you want to look with your thermal camera. As we said, it's most valuable when you have a plan. When you don't have a plan, it's just going to give you a ballpark. 
And in both cases, that's all it is. It is going to so, give you a ballpark. So knowing that, we know what the shortstop is. We know what its shortcomings are. We know how to use it. Now, let's identify the location using the troubleshooting kit. Now, the great thing about the troubleshooting kit, it's going to tell us exactly where the problem is. It's not going to say, oh, it might be over there, it might be over here. It's going to show you a red spot in the floor, and that red spot in the floor is where you need to make your repair. So let's talk about the troubleshooting kit and identifying that location. Right. So the troubleshooting kit uh, is a high voltage equipment, first of all. We always recommend to have a licensed electrician use the tool. Uh, and uh, the, the whole idea of the device is to test the insulation that protects the wire from each other and the ground. And uh, what the HiPod does, you can send those high sparks, the high voltage zaps of electricity down the wire to the point where that damages. And eventually those high voltage arcs will create a hotspot underneath the floor under your tile. And uh, that hotspot will generate the heat. And of course, using back our thermal camera, we should be clearly see where that uh, hot spot is on the floor by just simply monitoring the whole area and seeing that hot spot. Now, the thing about using the high pot is you don't have to use it all the time. If you go out there and you have a short from red to ground, or if you have a short from black to ground, that tells you you already have a short. Yep. So that's, that's part of the main thing right there because when we're zapping this wire, we're either trying to create a hot spot or we're trying to create a spot from the ground to one of the core wires that's gonna weld itself together. So you're trying to do one of two things there. However, if, you, um, if you're getting in there and you already have a short, we can use the next item we're going to talk about, and that's this one right here. This is where you have the thermal camera and you're going to be using what to get the picture to look like this. That step, we're going to use the variac, which is, again, the variable transformer. That's where we have a short circuit. And since we have a short circuit, that short circuit will have a lower amount of resistance in it, which means supplying 120 volt or 240 volt back to it will most likely just uh, blow it apart. What we want to do here is use a variac, supply a lower voltage than it's designed to, let's say 20, 40, or maybe 50 volts, and uh, we will supply that to only a conductor and a ground, in other words, to that short circuit. And uh, like you can see on the picture on the right side, that short circuit will only heat to a certain point, and that point will be your short, will be the point where the fault is. So again, seeing that image on the thermal camera will help us to clearly uh, in, uh, indicate where the spot need to be opened and where the short need to be repaired. Now, we know in a lot of cases what size roll or what size cable is in the floor. And let's just do sip, simple science, simple mm -hmm. science, because that's all my brain can do. So let's say that that, in theory, that this uh, product that we're heating up now has a normal reading of 100 ohms. Okay, so we know that this product is supposed to be 100 ohms. We get on here and we go from ground to center core wire across one of them and we get 50 ohms instead of 100. Well, now we know that our problem is about halfway down the mat or halfway down the cable. And as Anatoly said, we're not going to send 120 volts to this area because right. that would be double the voltage it's normally used to seeing. So we're only going to be, remember, we're only heating up 50% of this product. So we're going to provide less than 50% of the power it normally should get. So if this is a 120 volt unit and we're getting half of the ohms we should, that's telling us the maximum amount of voltage we wanna send through here with the Variac is 60. Now I can tell you from personal experience, you don't wanna to go to 60 because that may be, that's normally what it's able to handle, this small section. What we wanna do is we wanna start at 30 and maybe go up to 40 and see if we have um, an amp reading verifying that power is going into this section of the mat, that the short hasn't come apart. Sure. And that's what Anatoly was saying. If you send too much voltage through this short circuit, it just opens back up again. And now you don't have a short circuit anymore. And now you're going back to the high pot and zapping it. So you can see now, if we start with a product that has a short, we've kind of eliminated half of the steps because now we have a spot that we can, we can send some of the electricity down and we can start looking around with our thermal camera and we go, hey, I see 
that this coil is halfway lit and it automatically stops at this one spot. Well, if I see that it stops at this one spot, I know that's exactly where the short is. So now I just have to break up that tile and get at that product to get it repaired. So the next thing we've done, we found exactly where it is. We found exactly what tile it's on. Now it's a good idea to kind of triangulate with a piece of tape where exactly this spot is. Because remember, you can't put it on the tile because you're going to be bashing the tile up to take it out. So what sure. you have to do is kind of, have to put, a, put a piece of tape on the tile next to it and a piece of tape on the tile next to it and kind of triangulate to where it is. Then once we get that area up, once we get the tile up, we can then use our thermal camera again, turn the system on, and we can find where the cable is with our camera. And what we do then is we take a magic marker and we make a mark on there exactly where the cable is and take it from there. Yeah, so uh, the great part here is uh, there is a couple of tips that we always can use in this uh, particular step of the troubleshooting. Uh, there are many cases when there can be some sort of like not a clear spot or not a clear point on the floor. There's always a case where you can double kind of double test yourself by just simply uh, stopping your troubleshooting, keeping the point, uh, the piece of tape or indicator on the on the tile, wait until the spot cools down zap it again or use the variac again and that if the same spot appears again you know 100 percent that's the area you need to work on and like scott said before after let's say you pull up the tile you can use your variac your high pot again to get even more clear picture because now you only uh transferring that heat through a thin layer of thin set so your uh thermal image your thermal picture will be so much more clear and you can nail exactly where that uh, where that spot that you need to repair is. Now, what you want to do is people ask all the time, okay, I know where this spot is. I need to get this tile out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, I'm going to start um, what, what people nine times out of 10 will say is I'm going to use a lever and try to get under it and, and lift it up. You're not going to be lifting up that tile. You, the, this tile we know is going to get destroyed because we have to destroy yeah. this tile to get at the spot. So what you want to do before you get into this is you want to make sure that the homeowner has some extra tiles laying around that we will be able to replace. Because if we do this the right way, we have one tile. That, that's all we needed to lift. We can go ahead and make our repair, put the one tile back down, and you're ready to go. The main thing that most people, when they call us, if they say, oh, if there's trouble in my floor, am I going to have to rip up my entire floor and start all over again? Oh, no, I don't want that to happen. Well, you can see using this tool that we found the exact spot. We're not lifting up any floor. Sure. We're lifting up one tile, and we're making our repair and putting it there. The, when you get this tile up, you're going to be smashing it with a hammer, and that's all you want to do. You, do, you want to get this thing uh, smashed so you can take the pieces up and throw them to the side. But what you have to do before you start bashing away at this tile is to score the grout line because if you don't take the grout line a little bit of it out, as soon as you hit that tile, it may migrate into the tile next to it. And you don't want that to happen. So you, you get down into that grout line. You take some of the grout out. But you don't want to go more because if you get too deep, you're going to go into another wire. So you got to watch out for that. So what we're going to do now is we know where this spot is. We take out the grout line. We take our hammer and we smash the tile. We get the, the debris out of the way. And now what we can do is if we have our thermal camera, we can see... With the thin set still on, we can make a mark as to where that wire is. And then the next step, after we mark where the wire is, why is that so important? So uh, marking the location of the wire or marking, let's say, the location of the loop, like it's shown here on the uh, on the image after it's already pulled up, will help us to know where the uh, which direction, first of all, the wires are going. So we know where we can hit, where we can start chiseling that thin set out. So, uh, because we're going to chisel right in the middle of the, of the wire. Correct, yeah. We want to know where the lines are. We know the spacing between those wires are typically three inches. So we know we want to hit only in between the wires, never, you know, somewhere down the line where the wire can be there, uh, can go or where the U-turn is. So if you take a look at this picture, you can see sometimes when people use a sharp knife to clean out the grout lines, like we suggest that you don't do. But if, you, if, you're, if your guy did that, um, what we need to do is sometimes we might have to lift two tiles to get at sure. that spot. Because if, if the grout line is cut, you might have to take two of the tiles out. If the grout line is cut um, up where three of the tiles meet, you may have to remove three tiles. 
So that's why it's always a good idea to find out how many tiles that the customer has. And you also have to be able to lift up the cable to be able to make your repair. To make the repair, let's talk about that. What's the first step? Sure, yeah. So the uh, when the wires are exposed, we have a full access to it. Uh, the first thing is, of course, to cut out the damaged portion. That's a really main important part. You want to make sure that all the damaged or burned or melted part of the wire that, again, for, for some reason was uh, damaged or failed here, will be totally eliminated. So when you will make in your repair, it, the repair will be done exactly between the two clear, nice, brand new sections of the wires. And the first step, of course, will be to start with removing that protective casing of the wire because we want to get all the way down to the main core wires that we will be connecting. Now, we had a couple of questions and I forgot to address them on the previous slide. But um, one person asked, does this work have to be done by an electrician in some municipalities? And in some municipalities, you definitely have to be done by a, a licensed electrician, but we always suggest that this work is done sure. by a licensed electrician because it's very, very high voltage. So uh, we would expect that a licensed electrician would be doing this. Um, somebody did ask, uh, how do you pinpoint the break in the wire? So we've already shown that. So I think that should be pretty self-explanatory at this point. Um, and also if the unit is correctly checked before the tile installation. So if they check the, if they check the wire before it's installed and they put it in, and now one day later, 19 years later, 25 years later, what, what caused it to fail? What, why did it pick now to fail? And that's like saying, um, why did my light bulb, my incandescent light bulb pick now to fail? Um, it's, it's a radiant element inside there. So if the wire gets damaged, what happens is as it gets older and older, heat expands, contracts, expands, contracts. Now, you have high voltage running through these wires, and let's say there was a little nick in the inst insulation when it was installed. And sure. it, it's doing this a little bit, but it's never opened up enough for that wire for that power to sneak through the insulation. See, what happens is you have two, two wires carrying electricity, and if it gets damaged, it smashes them together, and it, and it makes the wires cut through the insulation and touch each other. That's what's causing a ground fault. That's what's causing a short, that sort of thing. So what happens is, as this expands and contracts, expands and contracts, eventually it's going to expand enough for that power to sneak through. That expansion and contraction may be one day, it may be two years, it may sure. be 20 years. That's why we just don't know the answer to that question. But that's a question we get asked all the time, and thank you, Mark, for asking that. The, the, the thing is, we can find out exactly where this spot is using our tools, and it's really not that big of a deal anymore to find out, to find out what's going on. So now we have the wire. We're going to get back to where we just left off. Yeah. talking about preparing the wire. So now that we've got it prepared, what's the next step? First very important step here is use that larger size heat shrink that will be provided, let's say, in the splice kit. And I think, oh, we, I think we forgot to mention, or I forgot to mention, first we're going to talk about the uh, wire repair with using a splice kit. The splice kits are available at Formula Yours. This would include all the parts needed for the uh, successful repair. And again, what we're starting with is sliding that larger size heat shrink that is supplied in the splice kit on one or the other side of the wire. You typically want to slide it on that longest uh, available side of the wire, and that's going to be that heat shrink that we will use to fully cover the repair when it's done, to make that whole section waterproof and nice again. So what is, what's going on here is the last piece that we're going to be using for the repair actually right. has to be the first piece that you put on. Correct. So it's kind of, it, it, don't tell me how I know this because <laughs> I forgot to put this piece on myself once. So it only takes once or twice, maybe three times making this, this mistake and you don't make it anymore. So the first piece you're putting on is the last piece you'll be using. So let's talk about the next slide. So yeah, in the next slide we can see kind of four next steps that we will be uh, taking care of here in the repair. And like we mentioned originally, First thing we want to take out that protective case and uh, protective outer layer from the wire that's visible on the image number two. Uh, and image number three shows that wire already without a protective casing, but still with that ground sheathing all around the wire. And this uh, image four shows us the next step where we want to separate those two inner conductors that are visible more in like a whitish color 
and the copper ground sheathing that is also separated. So we have our three conductors, which is your two main heating conductors and the ground sheathing. And here we're talking about the conductors that needs to be stripped because that's where we're going to use those bare conductors that also have its own outer insulation. That's where we want to use those crimp solder connectors that again supplied in a splice kit to join the wires together. We'll also join our ground wire together because of course we want to have the whole ground of the heating element be reconnected together. And for that we're going to use the butt splice and wire crimper. And like we spoke before, at the, in the very end, we're going to use that large heat shrink tube on top of the hull repair. Now, the thing is, um, I, I've talked to, to people that are going, okay, what size wire is this so I can use my wire stripper? You're not going to be using a wire stripper on these wires because depending on the length of the cable, all these little silver clear lined wires are all different thicknesses. So they are not the same. So you're going to be using a blade like we've shown you. Don't try to save yourself some time and use a stripper because as soon as you do that, you'll be cutting through the thin metal wire there and you'll have uh, more uh, trouble than you want. So please don't try to use a wire stripper for this part. So here we're talking about the uh, next uh, part of the repair. That's where we're using those pink uh, crimp solder connectors and we're gonna use two of those. We're gonna use one on each individual wire and uh, the beauty of those parts are that you just uh, crimp them onto the wire on each side of the wire, then you uh, melt the solder inside. And again, like I said, you're doing that on each of the conductors. That crimp solder uh, connector is also shrinkable on each side, so you can have that clear insulated repair and reconnection on each of the conductors. Let's go back one slide and take a look here. Notice how these wires are not the same length. On each side, one is shorter than the other. And the reason why, if we take a look here, as soon as you start stacking these crimp connectors up next to each other, you don't want them right next to each other. You want them offset, not together, but offset. So that's why one connection is shorter than the other. So you're gonna, a short one to a long one and the other short one to a long one. Right, right. That offset will definitely help us to keep that uh, last piece of heat shrink on, uh, you know, sliding over the whole repair and creating, uh, you know, creating less thicker repair in total. So when you're doing this, um, if you look there in slide number eight, you can see where both of the repairs have been heat, the heat shrink has been reduced in, uh, by, the, by the gun. When you're using the heat gun, it's very important to go around the wire. Just don't shoot it from one direction because if you shoot it from one direction, that side will, will get smaller and the other side won't. It'll just stay expanded. So you need to make sure you get the heat all the way around it. Also, if you take a look at picture number eight, notice the difference in the thicknesses in the center of the metal part compared to number seven. Number seven, you can see that solder is still there in the center. Once we hit it with the heat gun, it almost flattens out completely sure. flat. So that's how you can tell whether the solder has run. Take this one bit of advice. When you're doing this, make sure that the ends seal up first and then do the solder. Because if you do the solder first, it's going to go out through the open ends and then you're going to be starting over again. And you don't want that. So remember, do the outer edges first, then melt the center, and then we have that. Uh, we have a question from Sam. And Sam, I feel like I'm at the optometrist's office because I'm having a hard time reading this. It says power Sam, surge. Yeah, Sam is asking about the power surges that can create fold and generator, utility switch, and lightning. And I actually got that similar question this morning. It was where the power surge seems to be uh, just overheated the thermostat or most likely the power surge created a high voltage that caused uh, the thermostat to overheat and melt some wires. So typically, whenever we see a power surge happening, uh, first thing we want to know is if that power surge just killed the thermostat or that power surge created a short or a break or some sort of fault in the heating product. That will help us to understand what needs to be replaced, what needs to be troubleshooted. I can tell you from experience, a friend of mine's house just got hit with lightning last week and they had power surge uh, uh, protection on their televisions. Their televisions aren't working anymore. So if you get a direct hit, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to take the thermostat out. Sometimes it's just the thermostat and your, and your floor is fine. I have yet to see a floor that was damaged beyond repair because of a lightning strike. I've seen thermostats sure. that melted, 
but that but that's usually not a big deal. But that's a great question, Sam. Thank you for um, sending that to us. So now in number eight, we can see that we have our connections made and that's why you don't strip the wire all the way back. See how the clear wire still has the insulation left between the pink and the, uh, the, the Merlot color? That's insulation there. The reason why those aren't bare wires because if they were bare, then as soon as they touched each other, you'd have another short again. And as soon as the ground would hit, they would have another short again. That's why it's important that you only take a small part off of each one of those clear wires because then you have the heat shrink going over the insulation of that particular um, core wire too. So very, very important to follow the instructions and the instructions do come in the kit. So make sure you follow those. So now we've got this part done and I've got to go back here and hit this magical arrow and we are ready to go to number nine. Yeah, so the number nine, the, the next step would be to, of course, reconnect the ground. Like I mentioned previously, you want to make sure the ground is reconnected because you want to have the whole system still be grounded. You don't want to have that misconnection there happening. And uh, to reconnect the ground, we provide an uninsulated butt connector in the splice kit. And that's where you just crimp one side of the ground sheathing into that uh, butt connector and do the same with the other one. So on the image 11, you can see that ground is reconnected reconnected back and the image 12 shows how we start sliding that final heat shrink over the whole repair on number 11 you can see that uninsulated butt connector be, can be used because all the other wires are insulated correct yeah. so you don't have to worry about putting this in a waterproof or or, um, or insulation because you don't have to worry about it if we take a look back here though uh, here's another bit of uh, wisdom that can save you um, a very long repair and that is when you're doing the, um, when, you're, when you're using the, the heat gun on these individual repairs, make sure that that red heat shrink tube is as far away as it can be. And if, if, if it has to be next to, you know, you don't have a lot of room in some of these. Sure. If it's really close, what I do is I get a, a rag and get it wet. And I put that wet rag on top of that last piece of heat shrink. Because if you're using the heat gun and all of a sudden you slip and, and go, you start blowing hot air on this red one, this red one is not going to fit over that insulation if you do oh, yeah. that. Then you're in trouble. And you know what you're doing at that point? You're completely redoing your repair again because you've got to get a good piece of heat shrink on this repair. So please be careful with that. Don't ask me how I know that part. Yeah, so like Scott said, that pink heat shrink here, as soon as you just add a little bit of heat to it, it starts to shrink pretty fast. So yeah, good point on you know, just protecting that uh, pink uh, heat shrink on it and we're keeping that as far as possible. And here we get into our last step of the repair is where we pretty much just adding that final heat shrink, centering that over the repair by, again, just simply touching, feeling where the uh, repair is. We can slide that heat shrink and have it exactly in the center and slowly applying that heat gun over the whole repair to sh make sure it's melted evenly all around uh, the heat shrink will create a nice waterproof uh, coverage around the whole repair, around the wire here. And uh, the great thing about those heat shrinks that we're providing here, those have glue inside. And as you can see on the image 15, that glue comes off. That means your repair is done correctly. Yeah, we have a question here um, that has come in. And can I use duct tape on this? Uh, that I'm going to try to be as polite as possible and say, no, please do not use duct tape on these repairs. You have to use heat shrink. Now, the good thing about this is when you get this in the, uh, this in the kit, the instructions actually have part numbers on them for Fastenal. And Fastenal is a nationwide um, company. And if you go to that nationwide company, you go to www.fastenal.com. Dot com, they will have a store locator and you put your zip code in there. It'll tell you where your, where the nearest store is. On the instruction sheet that we send along with this kit, it has the fast and all part numbers right on it. So right. you can take the sheet of paper and go, I'd like this, 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 and this. And they go, okay, here's this, 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 and this. Thank you so much. And then you're ready to do the repair. If you need the stuff right away, that's probably the best way to go. And we chose fast and all because if you go on their website, you'll see that there's a lot of locations in the United States. You can also go ahead and get the stuff at a big box store if you like. The most important thing is if you're buying this stuff is to make sure that it has one of these two names. 
dual wall or adhesive line. They usually mean the same thing. The cheap, cheap, cheap heat shrink is not adhesive lined and it's not dual wall. And you can tell because you squeeze it together and it doesn't stick. This stuff, when you squeeze it together, it'll you, you push it down and you take your hands away and it'll pop open and it'll make like a little popping sound. That tells you that it has the adhesive lined product inside of it. If you take a look at picture number 15 here, the way you know that you've got your heat done in a nice method around the wire, not just for shooting it from one side, is you'll start to see the clear liquid coming out the edge of the repair. There, as you can see, number 15, if you follow the cable up to where it meets the red heat shrink, you'll see that clear stuff coming out. That's the adhes adhesive inside, and it's doing two things. It's gluing the repair to the wire, and it's also making it waterproof. Those are two very important things when you're doing a repair on an electric wire like that. So that was a great question. Thank you for supplying that question to us. Um, very, very good crowd participation. Now, we've shown how to do all this. So we know how to get the wires open. We know right. how to cut it open. We know how to get it ready. Now what we're going to be talking about is a way to do it with solder. Now, if you take a look, the main difference here in this photo is that these two wires are the same length. Correct. There is no offsetting happening here. They're the same length. They cut just in the center. Depends on how much available wire you have to work with. Uh, we're going back to the same, uh, you know, same problem here. We want to reconnect those wires. We want to reestablish that circuit and that grounding. So uh, here in that method, we're going to be soldering the wires together. We want to start with exactly the same thing. We want to move that heat shrink to over a repaired area in the very end and keep it there before we're done uh, with the repair. And same thing, we want to make sure it's fully covered, fully waterproof when the repair is done. And uh, slide number two, uh, actually the image number one, is where we sh adding another two smaller size heat shrinks on each of the conductors here because we want to insulate those just like we did in the previous method. We want to insulate each repair, each conductor individually to ensure they are not touching each other. So moving on to image number two, that's where we start soldering those together. Image number three shows us that uh, connection is being done. There is solder applied to it. And of course, image number four is where we sliding those smaller pieces of heat shrink back onto the connection part to uh, later on uh, apply the heat gun and make sure they're gonna be fully insulated there. Now, a lot of people ask, which one should I use? Should I use the solder method or should I use the butt connectors? If you've never soldered before, I would say use the butt connectors because it's a simple mechanical thing and you blow heat at it with a heat gun. Very, very simple to do. If you have worked with solder before and you're very comfortable with it, it's probably the best one to use, but it has more of a learning curve. You have to definitely learn how to solder to do it the right way. So if you have any doubts about your soldering skills or you've never done solder before, please use the butt connector because you're going to have a good success rate with that. If you're an electrician or if you're very experienced, then this would probably be the way that you want to go. So going back into our solder method repairs, image number five shows where we apply that heat gun over the heat shrinks. Again, make sure you apply it gradually over the whole kind of uh, circumference of that uh, heat shrink of that repair to make sure it's melted evenly and make sure it uh, shrinks evenly and doesn't allow any of the, let's say, potential water or anything comes into it. We want to make sure those are individually insulated. Uh, step number six or image number six shows us how we want back, uh, we go back and reconnect this ground uh, sheathing here. Again, that can be done with a soldering method like we're shown here. If for some reason it needs to be done uh, with a butt, uh, uninsulated butt connector, that's totally fine. Image seven just shows us all of the conductors and all the ground is connected back. You can see we're starting uh, to slide that final heat shrink over to the repair. And I believe the next slide is where we can see we're doing the same exact thing. We making sure the repair is exactly in the center of that final heat shrink and then gradually applying the heat gun making sure everything is nice and waterproof. Going all the way around the wire. Never shoot it from one direction. So there we are, we have our finished repair. Yep. And at this point, what you might wanna do is before you get the repair completely covered with the heat shrink is you might wanna do this test first 
to make sure your ground is good and your two connections are good inside, then put the final heat shrink on. But even if you're at this point, if you find out that this, uh, this repair um, is done well, then you're great, you're, you're done. Now, a lot of people ask, well, what if I have two problems? What if, let's say that this person that they're going in after has used a blade to clean out the grout lines. There's a chance if you have a person that's done a grout line and cut through the wire at one grout line, there's a possibility that it might have done it again and again in other places. So remember, we're just we're, we're doing the first repair first. It has to be done. Then we test it, see if it's good. Then it tells us the rest of the mat is good or the rest of the cable is good. If we do this test and all of a sudden the shortstop shows another 20 feet, then we know that this person has done it multiple times. We've done our first repair. We then go do our second repair, do the same thing, test it again, use a shortstop. And if it says good all the way through, then you're done. If it says another 30 feet, then you have another repair to do. So remember, you're only getting, you're only fixing one repair at a time. And you're fixing the repair that's closest to where the thermostat is. And you're working your way away from it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's a very common question. Pretty much, I would say none of their repair tools, none of their repair kits would provide ability to test the system and find out all of the damages or all of the fault at the time. So like Scott said before, we really want to test or troubleshoot or repair the first portion. Then that would be the point where we would know if there anything else down the line that has a fault or we have a completely brand new system. And to, to find that out, of course, we doing that resistance test. We, now, what I would do, one thing, and I totally forgot sure. to, I forgot to mention, I apologize for interrupting, but when we are doing our, in, our, our repair, let's say when we have our wire taken apart, at that point, what might be a good idea is to test the wires face going this direction and test the wire going the other direction. Because sure. then if I twist the wires together at the thermostat, and then I test the wire this way going towards the thermostat, and I get a complete circuit, I know the spot where I am back to the thermostat is good. Now, if I put the shortstop on the other wires that are sticking up here, I can then test to see what the condition is going that way. And if Correct. it tests good that way, and if it tests good that way from my spot on the floor, I'm pretty sure that when I make my repair, I'm going to have a continuous circuit from the thermostat all the way to the end. So that's one thing you can do if you think you might have a second problem. Um, and we're, we're, we don't know that until we do that test. So I'm glad we thought about that at this point because you want to probably do your resistance test when you're in the middle of this repair before Makes you sense. start putting them together. Yeah, generally speaking, the resistance test can can be done in you know multiple different uh, steps of the repair. The goal is here, of course, to find out if uh, the, that one and maybe the only one repair is the one that done successfully and we reconnected, we reestablished the whole heating mat or we need to do any additional testing to find out what's happening and what's causing that mat still not to heat up. Now, we had a couple questions here. Um, a, a job I did several years ago has lost the embedded temp sensor. The system is running on air temp only, and I'd like to restore the force sensor or replace it. The original sensor worked for over a year before failure. Um, the first thing we have to do is just say, hey, test this with a digital ohmmeter. And the thing you want to find out with your digital ohmmeter is to make sure that it has a 20K range, which is 20K, which means 20,000, because your ohm reading on your sensor wire should be between 8 and 18,000 ohms. So that's where you want to make sure that it's tested first. Then if it tests bad, then what you can do is you can turn your system on, go get a thermal camera or a, thermo a thermometer of one of those shooting guns that you shoot... Um, an infrared light at or whatever, and find out where the heated area of the floor is. And then once you find where that heat is, you take the sensor and you can stick it into that area. The secret to get the sensor into that area is that you take out the grout line of the tile to get out over to the heated section of the floor, push the sensor down in there, and then cover it back up with grout. That way you can get a good reading on your floor again. Just make sure that you turn the system on and find out where the heated area, because if the heated area is over here, you don't want to put your sensor over here because it'll never heat up. The one question we get, and I'm surprised we didn't get it for this one here, is how far does the heat radiate from the wire? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, great, great question. I mean, the, uh, the cables are typically spaced about three inches apart. And that... there's a reason for that. 
the, the reason for that is uh, because typically the heat radiates about inch to inch and a half from the wire. That would be the radius it, heat, it right. radiates around. So if you have this wire radiating an inch and a half and this wire radiating an inch and a half have and a they're nice three inches heat. apart, you have nice even heat. That's why when you put the wires too far apart, we start to get that striping effect where there is going to be just a colder, colder stripes of uh, non-heated areas where, again, in some points that wire still will provide heat if it's spaced, let's say, six inches apart, but there's, there's going to be a cold spot, cold stripe in the between. Now, remember, when somebody says, hey, you know what, this floor was put in and now there are cold spots in this floor. When I walk over here, it's cold, and when I walk over there, it's, it's, it's cold too, but it's warm in between. Well, that's usually caused by that first slide that we saw is when the mats are too far apart from each other. And then you step here, it's warm. You step here, it's cold. And you step here, it's warm again. Right. So remember, that's that's not the system not working correctly because 99 times out of 100, if you're getting heat in the floor, the whole system's working. Correct. Okay. So if you have a cold spot in one isolated area, that's usually because there's no heating wire under it. One common uh, question we also get is, can I buy mat and put it in the center of the room and have it heat the entire floor. And just as Anatoly uh, answered that, no, it's going to be warm where that mat is and it's going to be cold in the other areas. So that's that's one thing. It's, a, it's, it's, it's questions like that that we get every day that are very common questions that you wouldn't think common sense would apply to and they really don't because you would think the temperature just goes out this way, but it really stays right where that wire is. So it looks like that's all the questions we have, the ones that were supplied to. Oh, we had one more question. It says, I have loose tiles. What do I need to do to replace them? Well, the first thing, if you're going to, if you have loose tiles, you may have to break them up to get them up out of the floor. If you're going to be doing that, we suggest that you get a circuit check and right, attach no. it, take your thermostat off the wall, attach the circuit check to the wires, and then start breaking that tile up. Because if you break it up, you're not usually going to have a problem getting the tile down. But if you need to get rid of some of that thin set so you can back butter the tile and put it back down again, you may have to get rid of some of the old thin sets that's there. And you don't want to do that haphazardly because when you're chiseling it away, you may actually hit the cable. So that's where the circuit check is going to be attached to the wire. And you're going to be kind of being careful as you do that. But if you happen to hit the wire, it'll scream at you and say, stop. That way you can make the repair right in that spot. Yeah, just like a reverse process to installing and using the circuit check here. We're just trying to remove the tile step by step and having the circuit check to, uh, do the job for us and notifying us if there anything happening, if there any damage happens. So that's a great question, Fritz. Thank you so much for asking that. We do get that question often. So if you have loose tiles and you don't have a circuit check, give us a call, order a circuit check, put it on there, and then do your excavation at that point. So thank you so much, Fritz, for that. Great question. Let's see if we have another ant question here. Uh, this really doesn't have to do with repairs, but it says, can this product be installed in hardwood floors? And the answer is yes. So if you'd like, we can send you information to show us how to do that. Or you can go on our website and check it out and just do a search for hardwood floors. And you'll get a whole list of items that show you how that's done. We have pictures that show how it's done. The installation manual actually talks about it. So that's a very good question. Thank you so, mu so much for submitting that question to us. And, and that, oh, you're welcome. He said, thank you. So very kind of you to do that. So let's talk about our next webinar. And our next webinar is going to be everything you need to know about uncoupling membranes. Sounds interesting. Yeah. That's going to be Thursday, December 14th. So it's going to be uh, right in the middle of your Christmas shopping. So make sure that you um, do that shopping ahead of time so you can join us Thursday, December 14th at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, now that we're on Standard Time again. And our monthly promotion for this month of November is free ground shipping on any order. Uh, that goes from November, November 1st to the 30th. And you can visit warmlyyours.com to learn more about that. We also do value your feedback. You'll receive an email shortly asking you about your experience during this webinar. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and uh, we really appreciate you spending the time to watch with us today. 
Uh, you can contact us whenever you want to. We're here if you have any questions. You can call us at 800-875-5285. You can email Julia Billen, who's the owner of the company. She's at jbillen at warmlyyours.com. Or you can get general information at info at warmlyyours.com. And we are on the World Wide Web, believe it or not, www.warmlyyours.com or on Facebook, which is Facebook slash Warmly Yours, as we all know. So we'd like to thank you so much for watching today. Thank you, Anatoly, for joining us. Thanks, Scott. Uh, until next time, stay warm and be radiant.